Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, if you will. We're continuing our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of 1 Corinthians. Um, when we talk about rightly dividing God's word, sometimes people think that we're saying that you can't read the Old Testament or you can't read anything outside of Paul's epistles and so forth. And, and that's just not true. To rightly divide God's word is to study all of God's word, but make the distinction that God himself makes. He says to rightly divide the word of, word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Um, what that means is, just like if you go to a college or university, depending on your course of study, you want to major in something. If you're going to be a doctor, you want to major in chemistry, biology, anatomy, all the things that you're going to use for that profession. It would be foolish as a, as a you're trying to train to be a physician and you take a bunch of English and journalism courses. You do that if you want to be a writer or, or something like that, or journalist. Well, today as grace believers, there is a, a portion of scripture that is directly to us and about us. I always say, all scripture is for us. All 66 books of the Bible are for our learning. We need to know them. But not every book of the Bible and not every verse in the Bible is di written directly to us and about us today. When you rightly divide the word, you understand that it's the 13 letters of the Apostle Paul that speak to us today. That's why we as preachers in the pulpit must go verse by verse through Paul. But that doesn't mean we neglect the other parts of Scripture. Today we're going to be in the Old Testament a lot. And when Paul takes us to the Old Testament, we go and look at it. Today our study is Israel, our example. And what we're going to see is that God has the nation of Israel in the scriptures, his people in prophecy, outside of our dispensation of grace. And what they, what they do is they show us how God feels about sin. They show us how God feels about righteousness. We can learn from Israel God's purpose in the earth and so forth. And one of the things we're going to learn today is there are examples of not, how not to lust after evil things. Let's look at that. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Paul's going to use those particular group of people, the nation of Israel, God's people in the earth, in prophecy in time past, and in the age to come. What God's doing today is very unique. It's a mystery dispensation where he's dealing with all nations. Before Paul was saved, God only dealt with one nation, the nation of Israel. When this dispensation of grace ends through the resurrection or the rapture, God's going to go back and deal with Israel. You see it in the news, all this stuff with ISIS and the beheadings and burnings. All this focus in the Middle East is because... The stage is being set for God to, to uh, finish that prophetic program in the Middle East. But before he does that, praise the Lord, he's going to take us home first. He has to end our dispensation to deal with Israel. But you can see, just turn the news on and you'll see that focus in the Middle East. Iraq, Syria, Iran, Israel. Because God, that, that, that spirit of, of prophecy is beginning to get stronger and stronger as the spirit of the mystery gets weaker and weaker, as the body of Christ continues to reject sanctifying truth. So what we're going to see is, what does Paul have to say about the nation of Israel here in chapter number 10? Let's look at it. We left off in verse 2 last time, but I'll start, start here. Verse 1, he says, moreover, brethren, okay, Paul is dealing with all these different issues to the Corinthians, members of the body of Christ like you and me. He says, moreover, brethren, and you can tell they're saved because they're brothers, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. For those who weren't with us last week, make sure you, you uh, check out the video when Ryan posted. But we went through all of those verses where as God brings Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt through Moses, there was this Shekinah glory cloud of God. And as they went through the wilderness, he kept them, he kept them cool in the daytime and that cloud shielded from the from the, 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 the sun and so forth. But at night, he was a flame of fire, and it was a separation from, from Israel from the Egyptians who were following them. Then when they got to the banks of the Red Sea, they thought they were going to die, and God had Moses with the rod split the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went across on dry ground. The Egyptians followed them, and they were swallowed up by the sea. And when it says they were baptized unto Moses... Most people, when they think of baptism, they think water. I've, I've dealt with people for years, and, and the average mind, when they think of the word baptism or baptized, they actually think water, okay? But unfortunately, not every verse in the Bible that talks about baptism has to do with water, or at least getting wet, because even, let's look at that again. Look at verse number two. And so these are the fathers of Israel. Paul is particularly talking to those Jews in the body who got saved there. 
and, what, and verse 2, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. At no time did the people of Israel get wet. We saw last week, he actually froze up the waters. He froze those waters up. And, and what that baptism was, that was a dry baptism there. Who were the ones who got wet there in, in, in Exodus? The Egyptians. They got drowned. Um, go with me to Matthew chapter number 3. Go to Matthew chapter number 3, verse 11. Here's, here's a verse I like to show people that anytime you hear the word baptism, you must ask which baptism. I'm going to show you three baptisms in one verse. Go to Matthew chapter number 3. So go back to the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew chapter number 3. And I like to use this verse, and you can use it as well if you like to show somebody that every time baptism is mentioned, it's not necessarily water. Look at Matthew chapter number 3, verse 11. This is John the Baptist speaking to the nation of Israel about the Messiah. Verse 11. I indeed baptize you with what? Water. John's baptism was with water. That's that cleansing ceremony for the nation of Israel. It was, it was, it was a type of washing away their sins, cleansing. It was a cleansing ordinance. And the priest, because they're going to be a kingdom of priests, Exodus 29, the priest had to be washed with water, and then they had to be anointed with oil. That's why the Lord himself, he was washed with water, and then the Spirit of God came down upon him and anointed him for service. He was taking his place as, as the true Israel of God. Now watch what he says here. There's water. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. He's speaking to Israel. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. That's going to be the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. John says, this man is so holy I can't even be in his presence. Can't even mess with his shoes. That's what a servant would do, would take the shoes off and wash feet. He says, I can't even do that with this man. Speaking of the Lord. Verse number 11. He, that's the Lord, shall baptize you, Israel. Now notice the two things. With what? The Holy Ghost and with fire. So there's three different baptisms in that verse. You have water. You have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then there's the baptism of fire. Now, religion takes these things and mix them all up, but water was the first one. That was to identify the believing remnant of Israel. Later, once the, the Spirit of God came down in Pentecost, Acts 2, after the, the apostles laid hands on someone, they would get the Holy Ghost, okay? The Holy Ghost would come upon them. Now, this one right here is one that you didn't want to get. You don't want to get that. I was in a full gospel, black full gospel Baptist church, and they say, oh, brother, did you get the baptism of fire? I said, I don't think so. I'm still here, man. <laughs> they think it's something that, oh, you're going to be on fire for the Lord. No, no, no. You know what that is? That's the wrath of God. Yeah. And what the nation of Israel is going to get, you either get this one and this one. And if you don't get the first two, you're going to get that. That's the wrath to come. Who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. That's what he's saying, okay? And that's what he's talking about. There's going to be... These different baptisms. Now, if you want a definition of a baptism that fits every time the baptism is used in Scripture, it's the word total identification. Total identity. It's to identify something. The reason the Lord Jesus Christ had to be baptized with the Spirit of, with the water and then the Spirit of God, he was identifying himself with the believing remnant. When, when, a, when a Jew believed on Jesus their Messiah, they got water baptized, they were identifying with the Lord Jesus. The Holy Ghost would come down and baptize those believers upon them, not in them. We're the only people who have, when you trust Christ, where the Spirit of God comes and in us. That's the grace of God. That's everlasting life. With Israel, he would come upon them. But that, that baptism with the Holy Ghost, that was to identify, totally identify the believing remnant. Now, the ones who are going to be baptized with fire, that's to identify the unbelieving remnant of Israel, the unbelievers in Israel. Today, God doesn't require water baptism for you and me. On our way back to 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 10, go over to chapter 1. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Part of our Apostle Paul's gospel is that he did not receive water baptism as an ordinance for us today. There's a lot of confusion about that. Although Paul did baptize in the book of Acts, that was Jews. Paul never put the ordinance of baptism on us Gentiles. Look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, and we'll just go right into it, verse 17, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 17. 
For Christ sent me what? Not to baptize. But to do what? But to preach the gospel. And, and that gospel of the grace of God was given to Paul. It has nothing to do with water baptism. Because what we're going to see is that the baptism that we have today that identifies us in Christ is one that's not of water, it's of the Spirit. Look at verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words. When you, when you try to add water baptism, people say, well, we're saved by God's grace, no works. Then why water baptize somebody? That's a work. Well, really, you know, we're following Jesus in baptism. It's an outward sign of inward faith. You've got to make some stuff up to try to justify it. But if you just let people know it's through the blood of Christ and Him alone that you're saved, don't add any works to it. Notice what happened if you start adding things. The end of verse 17. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of what? None effect. You're going to take away from the saving ability of the cross. What God wants us to focus on is the cross of Christ for salvation, okay? Go over to chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Now many of you know these verses, but maybe there are some who are not familiar with these. You do have to be baptized today to be saved. That surprises people when I tell them that. As, as grace believers, we shouldn't tell people that baptism is not a requirement, because it is. But what's the question when you hear baptism? Which baptism? There is a baptism that we have to have for, for salvation. Look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one, speaking of the, 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 the human body and so forth, and compared to the body of Christ, and have many members. You see my body here, we have many members and so forth, but even as the, the local body of Christ, we have different members, okay? Verse number 12. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. Although we have different members to our physical body, God put it together and we're one body. And he's going to say the same thing about the body of Christ. So also is who? Christ. Christ is the head. We're his body. Four. Here's how that happened. How did each and every one of you, we're all individuals, we're all different, but how are we connected? How are we identified? Well, notice here, verse 13. For by one, what? Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. That capital F. That's the Spirit of God. When you got saved, the Spirit of God did something. For by one Spirit are we all, what? baptized into one body. Identified. That's an identified. That's right. That wasn't something a man did when he dumped you in water, pour water, sprinkle water. Put that stuff aside. That's what religion does to get you on the roll so that you can be in the seat so that they can say, look how many we baptized. They'll put the numbers up there and all that. They boast in that stuff. God says that my spirit put you, he identified you in Christ. That's what, that's what that is. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, your, your, your racial status or whatever, your religious status, all that stuff doesn't matter to God. Whether you be bond or free, your social status. You could be the lowest of the low, you could be free. We have all been, excuse me, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. We now have that same spiritual access to the Lord because we're in Christ, okay? Uh, go with me if you will. Go to Colossians chapter number 2. Uh, go to Paul's book of Colossians chapter number 2. If you're in 1 Corinthians, go for 2 Corinthians, uh, Galatians, and so forth. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter number 2. So we, we, we are to be baptized, but it is a spiritual baptism. It is not a physical baptism of water. Uh, the water was just the type and shadow of, of the real one anyway. Notice in Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 12. Buried with him in baptism. How can someone identify in Christ's burial? Romans 6 says we were, we were dead with him, we were buried with him, we were raised together with him. This is something that the Spirit of God does. A man can't do all of this. This is something, this is a miraculous thing that God himself does. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein, in that same baptism, wherein also ye are what? Risen with him, now notice who did it, through the faith or the faithfulness of the operation of who? God. God is the one who did this baptism. So please don't add to what God has done by using man's wisdom of words, man's works. You just want to realize today that baptism is a spirit one. And there's only one. Go over to Ephesians. Go back to Ephesians. <clears throat> Go back a couple of books to Ephesians chapter number 4. 
I'm just kind of giving you some of the verses to remember, to remember when you're dealing with people on why water baptism is not it. In fact, water baptism actually takes away from what God himself has done. God says, I did it for you. Don't you add man's works to it. Notice in Ephesians 4, verse 5. <clears throat> Start at verse 4. There is one body. The unity here. There's one body. There's one spirit. Even as you're called to one hope of your calling, and that's to reign in the heavenly places. One Lord. One, one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. One faith. That's Paul's doctrine called the mystery of Christ today. The mystery. How many baptisms it says there? One. One. And it's not water. I've, talk, I've talked to preachers before. I said, now, if the one baptism is water, how do you explain about the one where the Spirit does it? I say, which one is it? Is it the Spirit or is it the water? Well, they said, well, both. Well, no, there's one. You can't, that's two. The Spirit one and water. See, the moment you add water to it, you take away, you break God's word. He says there's only one, one baptism, and that's the one that the Spirit of God does, okay? So I just want you to remember that. But this issue of baptism when it comes to the people of Israel, go back to 1 Corinthians 10. This too is a dry baptism. Notice here in verse 2, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2. The, 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 the fathers of Israel, the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt, it says, and we're all baptized unto who? Moses. So if that word baptism means total identification, what was God doing when he brought the people of Israel out under that cloud and put them through the Red Sea? He was identifying them with a person. Who was that person in that verse? Moses. Moses. And that's why the people of Israel reverenced Moses, because called the law of Moses and stuff. Moses is the one whom God identified the nation of Israel. But why Paul brings this up, because the body of Christ out also, what we're going to see is that it's Christ and his spokesman, the Apostle Paul, who God sets us apart to. Paul is the spokesman of God today. That's why he wrote 13 books. That's why you have to rightly divide, and we study Paul verse by verse. Now, what is the Apostle going to do? Look at verse 3. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the Old Testament. You guys come with me. We're going to look at these verses that Paul tells us to look at. See, we study the Old Testament. We just do it in light of what the Apostle Paul says. That's how you rightly divide Scripture. That's how you study the Scripture. Let me show you that. Um, hold your hand here. Go, go forward. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. So it's Paul's... Um, it's the last book he wrote, but it's not in the order uh, that he wrote. There's Philemon, there's Titus, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. I just want to show you a principle about Scripture. People say, Brother Ron, how can I understand the Bible? Well, here's a verse that just succinctly tells you how to get understanding about the, about the Bible. This is going on my 20th year as a grace believer. I learned this verse very early, and it has blessed me and through our ministry others. I take this serious. In 2 Timothy chapter number 2, I'm just going to go right into it. It's just a principle here. Verse number 7. This is Paul writing. 2 Timothy 2, 7. Consider what I say. That's Paul. Now watch what the Lord's going to do. And the Lord give thee understanding in what? All things. You spend enough time understanding God's word through the Apostle Paul and, and then going uh, to, to the Old Testament and so forth. You'll st I, I didn't spend a lot of time studying the Old Testament. That's what religion does. They, they're all outside of Paul. I, I spend my time studying Paul, and when he goes into the Old Testament, I go and look at that, and I gain understanding. It, that, that principle is true, and I'll share what I see with you. Go back with me to Romans chapter number 15. Go back to Romans 15. Watch what Paul says. Go back to Romans chapter number 15. We're to learn about God's attitude towards sin, towards righteousness and things like that. We need to learn about His plan and purpose for the earth. Because if you want to understand His plan and purpose for the heavenly places, you have to first know something about what He's doing on the earth. And that's where the Old Testament comes in. Look at, look at Romans chapter number 15. Look at verse 3. Again, it's just a spiritual principle. 
For whatsoever things, 15.4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, Paul calls it in chapter 16, the scriptures of the prophets, the Old Testament, what we call prophets, were written for our, for our doctrine, for our learning. See, it's not written directly to us and about us. One of the things religion does, and if you spend any time, I, I was in a full gospel Baptist church for six months, and they spent all their time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Old Testament and all that. But when they went to those verses, the guy up there taught them as if they were directly talking to us today. But when those verses don't work, when you name it and claim it and all that stuff and it doesn't happen, when you're asking God why he didn't do this and why he didn't do that and all this, and it doesn't happen, they, they say it's your faith, but really it's because you're in the wrong verses. The verses that pertain to us today are found only in Paul's epistle. That's why you have to rightly divide. But see, they're not going to tell you that. They're going to mix it all together because if they give you the name and claim it, prosperity gospel, you'll say, hey, maybe I can get rich like the guy up there. Well, no, he's getting rich off of you guys, making you tithe. See, you've got to understand, religious system doesn't want you to understand the Bible, but God and Paul do. And what we're going to do is find out why God has these things in there. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, if you will. Look at verse 6. This is why we're going to go to the Old Testament. Watch this. Now these things were our examples. That's why it says Israel, our example. And here's the reason. To the intent, it's the intention that we should not lust after what? Evil things as they also lusted. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how Israel lusted after evil things. And what we're going to learn is God's attitude towards sin. Now the difference is God doesn't supernaturally just instantly judge us like he's going to judge Israel. He doesn't you know, let lightning bolts fall down. He doesn't destroy people in that way. But where your sin comes back to haunt you is at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, you know, I was going to say this too, Dorothy. If you're living a lifestyle of sin, there is sowing and reaping, right? So there is the natural uh, law of sowing and reaping. But where it's going to be everlasting is at the judgment seat of Christ. What's going to happen is you're going to stand before the Lord, the judgment seat of Christ. And each of us, if you're, if you're listening to the sound of my voice, you're saved, you're going to have a day before the Lord. The Lord's going to have all of us stand there, and he's going to review our entire lives. That's a scary proposition, isn't it? Knowing yourself. Because I'm the human too. But what you want to do is you want to redeem the time learning his word and letting his word work in you so that he can say, well done, and be pleased. Well, let's show you something. Look at um, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 10, 5. But with many of them, speaking of Israel, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Let's go look at it. Go with me to, we're going we're to start in Exodus. Mode. Exodus, go all the way back to the book of Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, second book in your Bible. Go back to Exodus chapter number, we'll start in chapter 16. Yeah, yeah I think we looked at the other one. Look at uh, Exodus chapter number 16. He talks about the spiritual meat. He talks about the spiritual drink. In Exodus chapter number 16, so we're going to use the rest of our time today looking through these Old Testament verses. There's probably not a month that goes by that somebody, or at least in the past, California is kind of different than the Midwest. In the Midwest, people are passionate about the Bible. When I say passionate about their religion, and although I got a lot of calls thanking, you know, for the ministry, I got some people who are upset. And they say, well, Brother Ron, you, you, you guys don't use the Old Testament. You never go to the Old Testament. I say, hey, you've never watched a study of mine. I can, almost guarantee, I can almost guarantee that every study I've done over 17 and a half years or so, I use some, some verses outside of Paul's epistles. I just write the Bible. But what people, are, they hear my emphasis on the Apostle Paul, and then they, they see the, the focus, like we, we major on Paul and minor and the rest, and they say, those guys don't go to the Old Testament. They don't use the Old Testament. But that's not true. So for you guys who say that, we, we're in Exodus. Old Testament, all right? I, I get, it, it's just funny, because they, they, they haven't watched it. They, well, they watch a little bit, and then they, I don't know what they're doing. They, they don't care. Exodus chapter 16. <laughs> How can you ever accuse me of not going to Old Testament? That's insane. Every study we go outside of Paul to, to compare and contrast. Look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. 
And they took, this is Israel, they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of sin. Let me show you something. If you want a good study with your family, I'm going to give this to you. There, were, there, were, there was a couple. I'm going to put their name on here. Just go home. Is the, do it with you. Go to YouTube. Jim. Jim and Penny. Now, they're not grace believers. They're, they're, they're believers. You know, they're saved. They're in the body. They're brother and sister. But they're denominational. Okay? Caldwell. All the things that are mentioned, what we're going to be seeing, they're archaeologists, they're explorers. Yeah. They took, you, you heard about, uh, mm -hmm. check this out. They took a verse from Galatians 4 where Paul talks about Mount Sinai in Arabia. And they said the maps are wrong. They, they said the maps are wrong. God's word says that Mount Sinai, where he gave the law to Moses, is in Arabia. So, so they went to Arabia and found everything we're going to read. All of this stuff. The 72 palm trees, the 12 wells of water. They found where the Exodus was. They found chariot wheels in, in the Red Sea. They found, uh, I think they even found a petrified horse, uh, horse corpse or something. Everything the Bible, they found. This is good study. Jim and Penny Carlo, just go YouTube it and watch it. It's, it's a blessing. It makes all this come alive. This stuff is real. Is it Split Rock Ministries? Is that what it's called? Yeah, Split Rock. Oh, they found the Split Rock. Right. Yeah. When Moses struck the rock, there's a, it's like a 60-foot rock. It's right in the middle of the desert, and it's split. It's, so it was a rock like that. And there's a split in that thing like that. And but not a, only that, check this water out. Water damage and stuff underneath it? Yeah, because it's on a hill. And then you can see like water, you can see tracks of water, and it comes into this big plain. You can see where Aaron and them made the golden calf, where, where the ashes were, the bullpen where they brought in the sacrifices. They found, they found a right by all this in the middle of the desert, they found tombstones, because thousands of people died and they buried, they found tombstones in the middle. They even found the stones that Moses cut out. They found nine of the twelve marble stones that he cut out representing tribes. And they were all different sizes. It's, it's, it's incredible. All that because they listened to the Apostle Paul. They, they're not even grace believers like us. They, they saw that verse and said, the maps are wrong. We're going to go find Mount Sinai because God said it's in Arabia. And they found it on the Arabia Peninsula. Sister Noah, she's from Saudi Arabia. She visited us. When we told her about that, she watched it. She, you know, she said, I'm so excited. I live in the, in the land that the people of Israel came out of. Yep. So anyway, that's a blessing. You, you guys can check that out on your own. But that's what we're about to see. Elam reminded me. Notice it says here. And they took their journey from Elam. <laughs> they found almond trees, <coughs> man. Aaron's rod that budded, showing that he was God's man. It was an almond rod. They found almond trees. They found quail, because God fed them with quail. The quail would take this long journey. Little birds take a long journey, and as they came over the mountain, they'd get tired. And right where the people of Israel were, the, the, the Bedouin people there said that the birds, they got so tired, they just dropped. And they fell. And Israel just went and picked the quail up and, and, and cooked it. God fed them with quail. It's amazing. Everything they said. 72 palm trees for shade. 12 wells of water. They were in the middle of the desert. Watch, the, that's what it says. Chapter 16, verse 1. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin. Isn't that interesting? The wilderness of Sin. <clears throat> which is between Elam and Sinai. Okay? All this is, is in my mind. After seeing the video, it's, it's, right, it's in my mind. And on the 15th day of the seventh, second month, after their departing out of the land of <coughs> Egypt, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against who? Moses and Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother, the high priest, his spokesman. By the way, Paul says that they murmured and God destroyed them. And we saw that when saints murmur against the Apostle Paul today, what were you telling me, Ellen, just in, in the study, uh, before the study, that you know people who actually call Paul a male show this, arrogant, blah, blah, blah. Acts 9.15, the Lord Jesus said that Paul's my chosen vessel. And the moment you murmur against the Apostle Paul, you're murmuring against the Lord. And he's not gonna, he's gonna hold you accountable there. <laughs> we remember this one guy who came into our study and he was kind of pompous. He's like, yeah, Paul, I don't listen to Paul because he's pompous, blah, blah, blah. 
I moved to the left like that. <coughs> left to the left, like Beyonce said. Because I was like, dude, <laughs> to the I, He was sitting there blaspheming the Apostle Paul. Muslims, if you if you even if, if you even write, if you make a drawing of Muhammad, they want to kill you. They did. They, they killed did. the people in France. In France. We believers need don't kill nobody. We need to have that same passion for God spoke to us, the Apostle Paul. Because he's the one who Jesus Christ chose to be his chosen vessel. Well, look here. They murmured against Moses. And when you murmur against Moses and Aaron, you murmured against God. Verse 3, chapter 16. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord, really, in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots, flesh pots is pots of meat and so forth, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Okay, is that the reason God brought them out? <laughs> Or did he make a promise to Abraham that your seed is going to go down for 400 years, I'm going to multiply them, and I'm going to bring them out by a mighty hand, and I'm going to put them in a land that they didn't even build, the land of milk and honey, and I'm going to bless them and make their name great? Or did God say, let's bring them out to kill them? The, the Egyptians were doing a great job killing the people of Israel. They talk about these flesh pots. They talk about bread. They forgot that these they, they were getting beat down as slaves every day. They cried unto God because of their hard bondage, and God delivered them in his graciousness and his mercy. And now they're murmuring, but that's what people do, right? They murmur. Verse number four. See, they're accusing God of ill intent, not remembering his promise to their father Abraham, that I'm going to bring your people out and give you a land, and I'm going to be their God. Verse four. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven, for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now everybody understands what's going on here. They cried out to God there in the middle of the wilderness. They say, Lord, we need food. And over in Psalms it said, man did eat angels food. And God let that manna come down. And every morning they would get a little bit or get enough. They did that for six days. But on that sixth day, they grabbed twice as much. Everybody remember that? You can read it. And what he was doing, he says, I want you to honor my Sabbath. Don't do any work. I'll give you enough for two days. It won't spoil. That's why that guy goes out there on the Sabbath. He starts collecting sticks. And, and God had him stoned. Not because God is unkind. Because the guy was going to go out and try to do what God says. He's going to try to cook and do all that. He was going to try to gather and, and, and do things that God says not to do. And that seventh day represents Jesus Christ's kingdom. God established a seven-day or 7,000-year 7, pattern. Genesis 1, God could have did everything in one day. He just, he's a God of process. And each of these days represents, in my opinion, God's dealings with men over, th over thousands of years. And on that 7,000th year, that seventh day, he called it his rest or his Sabbath. And what it is, it's for Israel. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. I, I talked to Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> they think we have to keep the Sabbath. Sabbath. I said, dude, you can't keep the Sabbath. Have you ever, I didn't read the, the Sabbath was for Israel. It's a type of that seventh-day reign when Jesus Christ comes in that thousand-year millennial kingdom, his rest. Read the book of Hebrews. That's what it's, it's all about that. The point is, that Sabbath rest represents where God, in, according to the new covenant, will give Israel his spirit. He's going to cause them to keep his commandments. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he shed his blood for the new covenant. And now that old covenant, Moses' covenant, will be replaced by the new covenant. And in that day, they can rest. They don't have to keep working in order to be accepted by God. Well, that's what's going on. God's going to give them this bread from heaven. In fact, the Lord says, I am the true bread from heaven. Remember that in John? The Lord Jesus says, I am the true bread from heaven. Moses gave them bread from heaven and they died. If you have this bread, you'll live forever. The Lord Jesus is saying, I'm the true bread. I love this. Go over to chapter, uh, go down to verse 15, if you will. Chapter 16, verse 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, speaking of this bread from heaven, they said one to another, it is what? Manna. For they wist not or they knew not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. 
It was sweet, kind of honey tasting. You could use it. The ladies could grind it up, and they made bread from it. They made all type of different stuff from it. When God made the Ark of the Covenant, he put the law, the Ten Commandments, he put Aaron's rod that budded. He took some of this manna and put it in there. It's to show Israel that God's going to provide. And that bread from heaven, that manna, represents the Lord Jesus Christ. One more passage here in chapter 16. Go to verse 35, if you will. Well, here, here's, here's where it says about them putting it in the ark. Look at chapter uh, 16, verse 33. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take the pot and put an omer full of manna, that was just the, the measurement, therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. You know, they say McDonald's food, they got so much stuff in it, you can put that cheeseburger right there on your, your, your table, leave for a few years, it'll still look like that. That's what it did. Well, you don't eat that. This manna, though, that manna didn't spoil. It's as fresh today as it was that day. My, my belief is that the Ark of the Covenant is still hidden from the days of Jeremiah in Israel, in Jerusalem. Um, I'll, I'll give you this one, too, if you can check it out. Just like Jim and Penny, you can check them out. You, they'll actually, you'll actually, with video, watch them do the whole Exodus route. Okay? And basically, the whole Arabian Peninsula, where all the oil, all those sheiks and the wealthy Muslims, they, that's just all Israel's land. They, they rich off of Israel. They, they force them off the land. The point is, they're going to take you through in video all of this stuff. It's, it's awesome if you like stuff like this, history. There's another guy. His name is Ron Wyatt. He did an interesting study before he died. He's dead now. He got to dig under Jerusalem, where the Lord was crucified, and, and the many Jews were crucified by the Romans. When you, when you read about in the Gospels, when he died, there was a great earthquake. The ground cracked. So he was on the cross, and his blood was shed. There's these cross holes all through there. You'll see all this in the video. He was, he was crucified with other people, two others. There's a crack, an earthquake. Ron Wyatt believes, because he says he saw the Ark of the Covenant down there, the Ark of the Covenant. And on that Ark of the Covenant, there's something called a mercy seat, okay? Mm -hmm. That's where the presence of God worked with the cherubim and stuff. And there, there was, there was, that's where the blood was, was for the atonement for the soul. Makes sense to me. It's pretty plausible that when that earthquake happened, because there's a reason there's earthquake that the blood of Jesus Christ, that he believes that Jeremiah, Jeremiah, when the Babylonians were coming, and so that Jeremiah hid that thing under there, okay? The Jews did. And that the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross went down through that. He says he found in that crack some, some hardened blood and stuff, that it went down through there, and it would have made sense that the very blood that's been pointing to this, all those <coughs> blood of bulls and goats and so forth for 1,500 years, that when Jesus died, that his blood went through the crack at that and went right to that mercy seat. Interesting. So check that out. His name is Ron Wyatt, okay? And you can see that. But he, that's his thing. Nobody's found it. He said that the Jews over there know it's down there, but that the Muslims are so radical that if the Jews, they, they're waiting for a Messiah to free them up to get it. And what that Messiah, he's really going to be the Antichrist, but that Messiah is going to rebuild their temple. And one of the things they need in the temple is the Ark of the Covenant or the mercy seat and so forth. He believes, he says that the Jewish authorities know it's down there. They're just not going to make it public because the Muslims would start World War III. But it's there. And what's going to happen, the Antichrist is going to free them up. If it is true, it's down there, which I believe it is. They're going to take it, and, and when they rebuild that temple in the future, they're going to put that thing right there and start sacrificing animals on it again. By which they're defiling it because the Lord's blood is probably on it. Anyway, that's just, just check that out, okay? So I'm going to show you this stuff is real. These things happen in history. That's what God did in the Old Testament. But they, but they constantly murmured against God. Go with me to Deuteronomy. You're in Exodus. Go forward. Leviticus. Numbers. And Deuteronomy. So go forward. Uh, three books. Deuteronomy. The fifth book of Moses here. And, and Deuteronomy chapter number eight, if you will. Eight. 
The reason I think that these things are coming out in these last days of grace, we have the technology now through videos. The Jews require a sign. God, Christ says, except you see signs and wonders, you would not believe. Mm -hmm. And we're coming up. The stage is being set for prophecy. The Jews need to have proofs. Mm -hmm. So you see signs on they require a sign. You've got to show them this. They gotta be able to touch it. We walk by faith, not by sight. But the Jews need to feel it, to see it. They're God's their children, they're the children of Israel. And so what I see God allowing now is, is the dispensation of grace go. You've got people who are zealous about these things and making it known, videos and stuff, and now the Jewish people will be presented evidence of all these things. That's what I see happening. But they require a sign. That's why I think all of this stuff, and with the technology, blessing of technology, you can have people go and investigate these things, record it on video, and make it known to the world. YouTube, I mean, this, this, everything I just told you guys, that's just on YouTube. People can see it all around the world. Look with me at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day, Moses tells Israel, shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. That's the reason he brought them out of Egypt. Verse 2, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these how many years? Forty years. Do you know that was to be a short time between the time they came out of Egypt to the time they went into the promised land, the land of Canaan, the land of the priests? It took 40 years, man, because of unbelief. And they just circled the Arabian Peninsula like that for 40 years until that whole generation of men who caused them to sin died in the wilderness. And then God says, by the way, Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, <coughs> second giving of the law. Because it was 40 years, that old generation of men, men of war and so forth, died in the wilderness. All the little children... The babies that came out of Egypt, they're now grown men and women. And what they couldn't understand when they were younger, Moses, before his death, 40 years later, he writes the book of Deuteronomy, and he repeats pretty much everything he said in Exodus. This is 40 years later. He repeats all this to adults now. I'm 42 years old. It'd be like if, if, if around the time I was born, the people came out. Well, all that generation is dead. Now God's going to speak to me as a man and understand, says, now your, your generation, Ron, you're going to go into the promised land. Do, don't do like your people 40 years ago when you were a little boy. Be a man and do, do what I tell you. That's what he's doing. Verse number 2, chapter 8, verse 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. And th that's, that's the key. Why did God, why did it take 40 years? He was trying to humble them. But can I tell you something? If you have a humble heart of faith, it don't have to take 40 years. They could have just said, Lord, we believe you. Take us in. He would have took them in. Same year, he, took them, he brought them out. God wants to humble you. He can't use you unless you have a humble spirit. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I can tell you how you can get closer to the Lord. Have that heart of humiliation and contriteness and humility and humbleness. God is He's looking for that. To humble you and to approve thee. He'll let you go through those situations. He says, Lord, your word is right. I'm wrong. I'm going to listen to your word. To try you, to prove you. Now watch this. Verse 2. To know what was in thine what? Heart. See, God tests you to see what's in your heart. Do you really have a heart of faith for the Lord or not? Are you just playing around with it? Same with them. Watch this. Whether, verse 2, thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. I mean, they didn't know anything about manna. By the way, the angels eat this book of Psalms. It's angels food. Man didn't eat angels food. <coughs> and it says, Neither did thy fathers. They didn't know what this was before God made it known. 
that he might make thee know that man doth not live by what? Bread alone. But by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Who quoted that? When the Lord Jesus was tempted by the devil? No, the Lord did. Lord did. He says, if thou be the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. And the Lord says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every... Why do you think he was in the wilderness? He went into the wilderness. He was fulfilling what happened to Israel. They were in the wilderness 40 years. He went for how long? 40 days. Wow. And what he was doing is he was taking, he was identifying with that believing remnant. Everything they went through, wow. he did. But instead of murmuring against the Father, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And as soon as he said that, the angels came from heaven and ministered to him. Probably brought him down. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? He passed the test. He's the true Israel God. Let's just keep reading a little bit more of this. This is just interesting. Look at, look at uh, verse number four. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee. Their clothes, after 40 years, in the wilderness, was still as new as the day they came out. But keep reading. Neither did thy foot swell. Walking through there. I, you, can, you got people who can walk from here to that door and their foot don't swell up. These people wandered around the wilderness 40 years. Never, their feet didn't swell. Keep, keep looking. These 40 years. And another passage says, your, the, the soles of your shoes weren't worn out. They had the same pair of shoes. That's like they living in the hood or something. The same pair of shoes. <laughs> 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 well, we went to Payless, right? Yeah. Well, didn't the children's clothes have to grow with them? Well, they they had they they could provide clothes as they're growing up with them. Yeah. He's just saying he's just showing the miraculous of uh, of taking care of them well, that so the things didn't wear out. Yeah. I, I doubt if the clothes just grew with them. No, they, they would have they would have made clothes. They had women. They did have materials that they took. And so. All right, here we go. Verse five. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. And that's that's the reason why God would inflict things. He did it out of love. You know, I talked to my daughter. She says. Daddy, do you love me? She asked me that. I said, yes, I love you. She goes, well, why do you, you spank me sometimes? I said, because I love you. He that spareth the rod hateth his son, the Bible says. I said, that's the reason, dear, why we stay on you. And I go, you don't get as many as you should. You get them every day. She girl crazy. Chris and I are introverts. When she's gone, the house is quiet. She is, she's like a tornado, man. She, and she, she will ask me a thousand questions, and she just want to learn. But, so that's what he's saying. There's a chastening because you chasten out of love. Verse 6, Therefore thou shalt keep thy commandments, excuse me, keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. And that's, that's what it is. And if you go on and read, he, he explains this land. It's, it's, it's got springs, it's got wheat, barley, fig trees, pomegranates, verse 8, olive oil, honey. They had gigantic grapes. I mean, remember, this was a land that, here's the crazy part, it was a land that giants inhabited. When those spies brought these grapes, they had to carry them on sticks. The grapes were like the, 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 just a, a, you know, a bunch of grapes. This was a beautiful land. They didn't have to do anything. God provided it. Now, for us today, the same thing is true, but for the heavenly places. There's a land out there, the heavenly places, that we're destined for. We didn't do anything to do it. God did it all. But he, by his grace, says, if you trust my son, yea, if you're faithful to him, not only will you inhabit that land, the heavenly places, many of you guys who, who are faithful now in the mystery will rule that land, will reign with Jesus Christ. That's our hope. That's our blessed hope. Okay? Go with me over back to Exodus chapter number 17. we got about 10 minutes. Exodus 17 Notice about this water. So they ate that spiritual meat, that man, type of Jesus Christ. Now, you remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4? The Lord says, uh, give me the drink. She said, you Jews don't have anything to do with us Samaritans. Samaritans had Jewish blood. They had apostatized years ago in the, in the northern kingdom amongst the Gentiles, all that stuff. If you're not familiar with that, you'll learn. But anyway, they were distant relatives of the Jews. God had a plan for the Samaritans. Well, the Samaritans and the Jews didn't have any dealings with one another. 
because the Samaritans went into Baal worship and so forth. Here's the point. The Lord speaks to this woman and says, uh, give me the drink. She's like, well, I don't have anything to draw with, so forth. He says, well, if you know who you was talking to, you would ask me for drink. And you'll never thirst again. She says, give me that water. We're going to look at that. I, I, I want to show you as we end, we're going to look at that because I want to get all the particulars. What all of that was is a picture of what's going to happen. Jesus Christ is that water. Now, what, if you go, if you look at that Jim and Penny Caldwell split rock, it's called split rock because you're going to actually see the rock that Moses hit. It's 60 feet tall, and it's split from the top down, all the way a crevice right down. And you can see where the water just flowed right into this valley, man, like an ocean of water. You can still see the grooves where the water was. And what happened was, everywhere Israel went, God, he told Moses, he says, I will stand between you and the rock. The Lord Jesus stood there, and Moses struck that rock, and through him came living waters. And he, 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 he quenched the thirst of the people. By the way, there's about two million people at least. Two million. But remember, they have animals too. They have cattle, they have sheep, they have goats. They have probably a million animals with them. And from that rock, he quenched all their thirst. That had to be a lot of water. An ocean full of water over the course of 40 years is my point. God supernaturally provided. And he was there, and that was a type of um, man on the cross. When Moses struck him, he had to go right through the water. Boom! And hit that rock. But check that out. Split rock. All right. That's what we're going to see as we come down to the end. Look with me at um, Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6. Exodus 17, verse 6. For time's sake, uh, let's just look at it. chapter 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Now you guys are going to see this on the video if you watch the call for Verse 2. Wherefore the people did chide, fought and, and, and argued with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Interesting. By chiding with Moses, you're tempting the Lord. And what's the Lord? The righteous judge. Next week we're going to see how he was just putting people to death, man. Because they kept messing with Moses, and he was just destroying them. Keep going, verse 3. And the people thirsted for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our cattle with what? Didn't they just learn, when they said, hey, you're trying to kill us with, with hunger, God rained food out the heavens, and they were just like, oh, okay. Well, now we're thirsty. Oh, we're going to die. <laughs> oh, we're going to die. And Moses said, did you not just remember what happened? It's, it's insane, but they're, they're carnal. They, they think that God is going to kill them, their children, and their cattle with thirst. Verse 4. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod, where, wherewith thou smotest the river, the one he smote the the river of Egypt with, with blood and so forth. Take in thy hand and go. Behold, now, now as we come down to the end, before we go to John 4, I want you to watch the words here. And behold, I will stand before thee there upon the what? Rock of Horeb. So let me explain this. Mount Sinai is the mountain peak here. There is a, a <coughs> valley of about a few miles, and then there's another mountain peak called Mount Horeb. They're right at the same place. You can stand on it. The, the Count William is going to stand on Horab. They're going to stand on Horab and look to Mount Sinai. The top of the mountain, I shouldn't even tell you, the top of the mountain is burned to a crisp. Now, why would the top of Mount Sinai, every, under, so there's, <clears throat> it's the same color of the other mountains, but on top, it's just like a burn to a crisp. Why, would, why, would the, why could they see with the camera the top of that mountain burn? Burning what? bush. No. When you, no. When you, Burning no. bush is somewhere else. Oh, okay. What happened when God came down on Mount Sinai? The mountain burned. Mm -hmm. The mountain burned at the presence of the Lord. It was on fire. And in that video, they're standing on the mountain peak of Horeb. They're looking at Mount Sinai. The top of the mountain is burnt to a crisp mm -hmm. to this day. It's, wow. it's crazy, man. Because when God was there, the burning of God's glory. Check that out. It's fantastic. Okay. Here's what's happening. 
We got him. So he's going to stand before there. The rock at Horeb. Verse 6. I will stand before thee upon the rock. The Lord's on the rock. Moses takes his rod and hits the rock, but he comes through the Lord. Boom! Type of, type of Christ on the cross. We now know later. And there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. Now again, you got millions of people, millions of animals. There's got to be enough water in the wilderness that can, that can quench their thirst. Let's keep going. Verse, verse number 6. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Okay? Now, in, in verse 8, this guy Amalek comes. we got to end, but Amalek comes. <laughs> and I used to say, well, why in the world did Amalek just show up? He's an enemy of Israel. Well, I, I can tell you why. If you're in the wilderness, in the Arabian wilderness, you're looking for water everywhere you can get it. I guarantee Amalek's men were somewhere around there. I bet they could hear. Yeah, they're looking for water, and here's God over there with Israel, and they could, I bet they hear like, whoosh, like the ocean. And they're like, what is this? And I bet they could smell the water. I mean, you're in the desert, you, they could hear and smell. These guys came to Israel to get their, well, they were going to kill them off and have them. That's what, that's what go on. They battle over territory, but like water and food. So it's interesting, you read it, then came Amalek and fought with Israel. He, he, I think he would. He sees this water just miraculously show up here, and this man, his people are thirsty. They're going to take it. By the way, the enemies of Israel are always trying to take what's theirs. Yeah. Yeah, to this day. They're on their land. When Jesus was casting out devils, what he was doing was Satan was just putting all his devils on the land God promised Israel. The Lord Jesus just come, and he just cast them out. Get out. Get out. He's taking, they're squatting on his land, and he's getting them out of there. That's why he was casting out all these devils. All right, we got in. Go into John chapter 4. Go back to the New Testament there, in other words. To the four Gospels, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter number 4. And what we're going to see is that this picture of all this water and so forth, I didn't get into all of it because of time's sake. We'll pick up a, a couple of more uh, next week, but... Look at John chapter 4. Since I mentioned it, I just want you to see what's going on. The most famous verse in Scripture is what? John what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And people, I, I drive down the street, there's signs, John 3, 16, you watch a football game, there's signs, some people write it in chalk on the ground, okay? And I understand why, because it's talking about the Lord and the But really... That's not the passage to use to show somebody how to be saved. It can start them off. The passage showing how to be saved, Romans chapter 3 from the Apostle Paul, how to be saved by God's grace today. But to use John chapter 3 as the verse to, about salvation is confusing because the book of John was written to Israel, not to us. Plus one chapter later, look with me at John chapter 4, verse 22. Look at John chapter 4, verse 22. Ye worship, ye know not what, you Samaritans. We, we Jews, know what we worship, for salvation is of the who? Jews. So to use John 3 to talk about salvation today, you have to say then salvation is of the Jews because the next chapter says it is. Now that's prophecy. To be saved, as it were, you had to go through the Jewish people in time past. Today, when you rightly divide, when Paul is saved in dispensation of grace, it is through the fall of the Jewish people that salvation comes to us Gentiles, Romans 11, verse 11. Now, let's go down and end in this passage, John chapter 4, and um, verse 6. John 4, verse 6. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary, uh, Dorothy, we were talking about his humanity and so forth. Uh, one of the things, he got tired, he got thirsty and everything, just like us. He was wearied here. With his journey, he set thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were going away into the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Verse 10. 
Jesus answered and said unto her, by the way, let me just say this. Notice it says the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. It doesn't say the Samaritans have no dealing with the Jews. The most famous parable is about the good what? Samaritans. They even named hospitals. The Samaritans were kind to the Jews. The pompous Jews just wouldn't, didn't requite that. The good Samaritan went down there. The Lord was trying to show Israel, these Samaritans who we, we Jews despise, they're kinder than we are. That's what he was doing with that. But anyway, let's keep going. The Jews have, verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, oh, and who it is that saith to thee, give me the drink. You know how the athletes say, you know who I am? There's only one man on earth who could say, you know who I am? That's the Lord Jesus. That's what he's saying. If you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink. Give me the, give me the drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee what? Living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to drink. She, she's thinking in him. She's she looking for a bucket. She's like, you don't have nothing to draw in the well. Watch this. Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Great question. Verse 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob? See, they were of Jacob. Which gave us the well and drank thereof himself. You can read that back in Genesis. And his children and his cattle. Oh, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall do what? Thirst. You, well, thirst again. If you drink that regular water, you're going to be thirsty again. Verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And then he goes on about that. She had the wrong motive. Well, she didn't want to be thirsty. Well, she, yeah, she was seeking something, and she found it. I think the whole reason why he, he went to her, he knew she would be there, Dorothy. Yeah. This woman, you go on and read it, man. She was trying to find, she was trying to find her love and acceptance from a lot of men. Right. She had five husbands. The man she was with currently wasn't her husband. She's just looking to be loved, somebody to take care of. Well, she got the man. Now, it's a type of Israel and all that with the five husbands. The point is, she's been looking for love in all the wrong places, and here come the Lord. She's ready for the Lord now. She's at the end of her rope, and she's ready for the Lord. By the way, she believed on him and so forth. She goes back to the Samaritans and says, I met the Messiah. And they were like, where is he? She says, come and see. They go find him. It's beautiful, beautiful picture of how the outcasts are the ones who the Lord goes to. Let's end with this. When David was on the run from Saul, out of jealousy, he's out in the wilderness with his 600 band of men, and it says that all the outcasts of Israel, the people with all the debt, this is exactly said that, the debtors, the distressed, that all those people says, we need to go out there with David. He'll receive us. And it says that all that came out to David, he received. And what David is is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, and all the outcasts of Israel come to him, and he receives them put. But let me say this, if you're listening today, and you're that outcast, you feel, you feel like, oh, I don't have what it takes to please God. Well, you're right. The good news is, God didn't ask you to try to please him. He says, come to him. And the way you come to God today is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So if anyone ever never loved you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure, the key words is for sure, where you're going to spend eternity. I love you, these saints love you, but more importantly, God loves you. And Paul, our apostle, says in Romans 5, verse 8, but God commended his love toward us. Now, this is where the love of God, in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you believe the Lord Jesus Christ is your only way to heaven, he's the only Savior, his shed blood paid for your sins, that blood that, that was shed on that cross, that same atoning blood for Israel, God, through his pure grace to us Gentiles, we don't deserve it. He doesn't have a covenant. He just says, if you trust my son, I'll give you everything. Well, praise the Lord. You can accept it right now. Now, we can also help you redeem the time. The days are short. The Lord is soon to come. I mentioned how the prophetic program, the, the stage is being set. So we're going to end our program pretty soon. God is. I want to make sure each and every one of you, here, think about this when you go home. If I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, it could be tonight. Will he say, you have wasted your life. What have you been doing? Or will he say, well done. Because he's going to test you on Paul's doctrine. He's going to see how much of Paul's truth is in your heart. 
And if you've been wasting time and you don't know it, redeem it, redeem it, redeem it. That's what we're here for, okay? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your truth, your love. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can study all your word, rightly divided, gain tremendous understanding. As we listen to the Apostle Paul, you are Lord Jesus, gives us understanding of all things. Thank you for allowing us to see your attitude towards the nation of Israel in their sin, your graciousness, but your, your attitude that, you know, sin has its consequences. Thank you for teaching us about both programs, what you're going to do in the heavenly places through the body, what you're going to do on the earth through the Lord Jesus and the nation of Israel, as we redeem the time learning these things fuller and fuller. May they take root in our heart and by faith bring forth the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to your praise and glory. Heavenly Father, as we have our Q&A and as we spend time in fellowship one with another, we give you thanks and praise in Christ's name.